Hey, how you guys doing? Aaron Henkin here uh, at the uh, WYPR studios uh, with my uh, friend Nate, Nate Kauser. And uh, we're going to do something pretty weird today. Uh, weird for Nate, especially, <laughs> because I'm going to actually uh, interview Nate. Uh, but while I'm interviewing you, Nate, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn from you to the camera repeatedly and do these asides to you, uh, <laughs> our viewers, to tell you kind of like what's going through my head as an interviewer and kind of get like a real time tutorial uh, about sort of like what goes through the mind of an interviewer, uh, for better or worse, uh, during the process of an interview, maybe how to some thoughts on how to be an active listener, uh, thoughts on how to sort of coach a narrative arc out of somebody when you're interviewing them, and uh, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how that turns out. Does that make sense to you? I'm just here to learn. You're so. here to learn. <laughs> okay, I'm, 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 I have no idea what's going to happen next, so this Let's should go. be interesting. <laughs> we are here in the uh, WYPR studios. Usually, when I do my recordings, I actually. Uh, I'm not in a room like this. I'm out in the world, and I use uh, portable recording gear. And I've got, mm -hmm. just so just to give you an idea, this is not my usual setup, but what I've got here is I'll just show you some of the gear I use. Look, there's all different ranges of prices and quality of gear. Um, there's lots of good prosumer-grade gear out there that you can find on various uh, forums online that give you advice. This just happens to be what I use. I use a... Uh, I use an Audio-Technica uh, shotgun mic, and I use a pair of headphones, just like the headphones that I've, I've got on now. And as far as my portable recorder goes, I use this thing, which is called a Marantz PMD-661. Uh, this is relatively new to me for the past 14 years in a row before this. I used the model that was immediately one number before this, the Marantz PMD-660. Uh, basically, it's like an external flash drive that has a mic jack in it uh, and a headphone jack and it records several hours of audio and you know people are always asking what's the best gear what's the best gear to me the best gear is the gear that you know how to use that you're used to using it's like if you think about the analogy of a camera right Canon or Fuji you know people will argue about that forever the camera you know how to use is the camera that's gonna work best for you so my advice for you is whatever equipment you end up with use it often Practice with it, and uh, you'll get good at it, and it will become the best piece of gear for you. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's what I'm going to say about my recording gear, and Nate will turn to you here shortly. Okay. So, um, you know, in my in the prime in the work that I do, I. Uh, interview oftentimes complete strangers that I don't know anything about. I actually know more about Nate than I do about most of the people that I uh, begin conversations with. And honestly, I don't know too much. I know somewhat uh, mm -hmm. uh, about Nate's work and about his uh, artistic path. Um, but what I would do at the beginning of an interview is, um, first of all, I would give the person that I'm interviewing a chance to sort of understand who I am and why I'm doing this interview. Right. There's this idea that the more kind of at ease and comfortable and transparent I can be about who I am and what my goal is, the more at ease I'm going to put the person uh, who I'm interviewing. Right. So I would say like to Nate, like um, this is a weird scenario. We've mm -hmm. got this interview going on and you've got me talking to the camera. Do you have any questions about how this is going to work or? Uh, I don't have any questions. I, I, I like to see how things go so I can learn something and then have a question mm -hmm. if it seems weird. Now, I'm listening to Nate, but I'm also listening to his levels, and I'm, I'm going to just adjust him and remind him to stay nice and close to this mic here. Okay, gotcha. Um, and at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead, and what I usually do for, uh, you know, what I do with these recordings is I take them uh, and I take the audio into my digital editor and I slice and dice it six ways till Sunday to create <laughs> the piece, the vignette that I want. It's a mm -hmm. little bit different than sort of a straight ahead sit down kind of live on the air interview. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do what I'll do first when I'm talking with someone is I'll say, let me give you a chance to introduce yourself. Uh, say your name, uh, tell me where you're from and, and tell me what you do. I am Nate Kowser. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, West Side. Um, I'm an actor, a radio personality, a jewelry designer, just an all around artist. Now I'm being care I'm listening. I'm nodding along. I'm not one thing I'm not doing is going mhm mm mhm mm mhm mm because you don't want that on your tape, right? You're basically you're you're making a portrait of somebody in, in the in the kind of work that I do. And so when they're speaking, you're basically trying to let the focus be as much as possible and cleanly as possible on your interviewee, Nate. 
Um, we're in a nice, quiet, soundproof room right now. If we were out in the world, I would try to find the sort of relatively quietest, most audio-controlled environment that I could to do my conversation. Um, so there's 101 different ways that an interview can go. Um, what I usually do is, for starters, uh, ask some just some general kind of um, sort of dinner party type conversation just to get a general kind of baseline of, of who it is I'm talking with and kind of what their personality is about. Uh, and so, you know, what, what, I'll, what I'll ask Nate now is like, I'll say like, so uh, tell me like what an average day is like for you. What are you, what are you up to these days? Oh, wow. Um, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, most of what I do is uh, just prepare the station that I work at Be Exposed uh, for the upcoming shows, uh, work on my upcoming shows. I'm actually currently working on a film project at the Peel Center. Um, so right now we're finding funding and finding new employees and uh, just getting the day-to-day project together so we can start shooting. Now, Nate has said a couple of things here that maybe I know what he's referring to, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe my the people who are listening long don't. So I'll uh, then kind of pick apart what he said, and I'll say, like, you, you mentioned a radio station. Mm-hmm. You mentioned shows. Yes. Um, tell me what this radio station is, how it works, and what the name of your show is, and what it's all about. Uh, well, uh, in terms of my show, it's called the Artist Exchange Radio Show. We come on every Friday at 7 and every Saturday at 2. Um, basically, I interview artists and entrepreneurs, community leaders, uh, and just try to pull out their story, uh, help them with engaging, not just selling their 15-second uh, ele- elevator speech. <laughs> now, I'm getting a better sense of what it is that Nate does. Um, mm-hmm. I still want to know a little bit more about this uh, station, how it works, where it is. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me what the name of the station is and, and sort of how it operates. Uh, the station name is Be Exposed Radio. Uh, we are online radio show platform uh, where we actually have an actual studio with 12 shows now under the roster. And we're located on Lexington Street, 110 East Lexington Street, right next to Mitchell Courthouse. What I want to do now is get a sense of, I mean, maybe begin to create a sort of a chronology for Nate. Uh, and so I'll ask him sort of to talk about like a transitional moment in his life based on what he's had to say to me so far, right? And, and I'll use something, actually, therapists will call this imago therapy, if you've <laughs> ever been in therapy, where basically you're saying back to someone um, what you've heard them say uh, in, an, in, 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 a, in an opportunity, which will give them an opportunity to, number one, let you, them know that you're listening actively and number two then to kind of extrapolate on on what they've said already so i'll say like what I'm, what i'm hearing you say is um you have a theater background mm-hmm. um and then at one point you um sort of changed lanes and got into this radio interviewing world mm-hmm. talk to me about uh, your theater life, what was going on in it at that point, and what inspired you uh, to sort of shift gears and start doing this radio interviewing thing? Uh, well, I've been primarily a stage actor uh, in Baltimore. I went to Coppin and learned the, the art of acting, and I've always been an actor. Uh, what was starting to happen right before I decided to do my own radio show was I wasn't getting the roles that I wanted. Um, and the city wasn't as diverse in terms of the theater community. So I wanted to take a break for a second just to kind of re-energize myself and decide what it is that I wanted. Um, I wasn't getting what I wanted, so I wanted to make sure I was making the right choices and I wasn't just paying Sally Mae for a theater career, and that's not what I wanted. (laughs) So um, had you heard certain... Uh, radio interviewers, radio programs that inspired you? I mean, like, what made you think, oh, I, my next step is to start a radio show and start interviewing people about their artistic mm-hmm. lives? I had uncles that were DJs and were connected to 92Q, um, one of the major uh, hip-hop R&B stations in Baltimore. So I grew up listening to my uncles on the radio, and I got a couple chances to kind of work there for the summer. So I always wanted to do radio. Um, I wanted to be a morning show host. That was kind of my dream. And then as I got older, I gravitated more towards the performance art side. Um, But it always stayed in the back of my head that I wanted to be like a host of a radio show. So I'm learning more about Nate, uh, which is all really kind of interesting to me. And while I'm listening actively, I'm sort of thinking, you know, I I could take this interview in a number of different directions. Um, uh, And but I'm also aware that, you know, I'm going to be cutting this together to sort of create a chronology of Nate's life. And so maybe what I'll do now is to create sort of like a, a flashback. Right. And to ask Nate maybe to rewind. And oftentimes when I'm uh, interviewing someone, 
you, what you're doing is interviewing, but you're almost also story coaching in a way. Mm-hmm. You're helping someone tell their story. Um, and so what I, I might do is, is a, and I'll use directorial language oftentimes. Let's pause there. Let me rewind you. Let's zoom in on this. And so what I'll say maybe now to Nate is like, uh, let me rewind to when you were uh, a young boy <laughs> and like you heard your uncles on the radio. Talk about sort of the, what, uh, what was magical to you about hearing those voices on the radio and just sort of what uh, what what sort of buried its way into your brain about what, what like what was special about that? Um, I've always been a pop culture person. So being able to attach like my uncle to uh, talking to and being in the presence of some of these people that I loved um, in terms of music, uh, it was like, oh, I can do that. So it was it didn't seem too far away from what, I, what was possible for me. So I, I figured, you know, if I just learn the art form then or get a job there, then I can actually work my way up to doing those things as well. Now I'm thinking like maybe we'll fast forward to the moment when uh, Nate kind of like first sat down and took that idea into practice behind a microphone uh, and sort of like what the first day on the job was like. And so I'll ask like, you know, um, take me back. Tell me the story of your first day, your first interview when you sat down. Um, how did you think it was going to go? How did mm-hmm. it actually go? Uh, well, the rule on our station is uh, before you come on, you have to do a test show. It's a live show. Everything is still the same way. And I have a lot of organizational skills, so I had everything bullet pointed as to what I was going to talk about for two hours. And I ended up doing everything and talking about everything that I was going to talk about in the first 10 minutes. In the first segment, it's 15 minutes. So I was, after that, I didn't know what to say. I looked at the paper. I had went through everything in 10 minutes. And I was like, ah. So I was really, like, lost. So that first day was not good at all. And we're not allowed to have a guest. So we have to do it ourselves and be in there by ourselves. So that, fast forward to the actual first interview that I had, was, like, smooth. Because I just took my time and asked them one question at a time, opposed to trying to rush through and just read from my script. This is fat. See, th- now is a story is emerging, which is fascinating. But also, I'm uh, I have one half of my brain on on how is the sound quality here? How's this mm-hmm. going? And I'm not like if we were outside and there was an audio disturbance, I would ask Nate to pause. Usually, basically, if I, if you do an interview in Baltimore, you, at one point you're going to get interrupted by the si- police siren or a helicopter. Mm-hmm. So like that'll happen at some point. Um, but like for example, in here, I'm listening intently to Nate's story, but I'm also noticing that he's doing like this on the table. And if you're listening along, you'll hear a little bit of banging. So I'll just you know sort to say, like, just be, to make sure you, you know, don't bang, uh, don't bang on the table. Right. Because you can all, you, it, no one's going to resent you for being in charge of the way this interview is sounding. Mm-hmm. If you are sort of comfortable and at ease and, and sort of let folks know, like, look, you got a steady hand guiding you here, you'll put them at ease. Um, so no, don't ever hesitate to kind of be the boss of how things are sounding in your interview. Mm-hmm. Uh, no one will hold that against you. Um, so... It sounds like you had a moment of extreme panic <laughs> a- about 10 minutes in, right? On your first. Yeah. Talk about that feeling and talk about, like, did you start to second guess yourself? How did you get out of that hole you had dug yourself? Um, I've really, I just looked through the window to my engineer as if he knew me. That was his first time meeting me. So he had no idea that I was stuck. He just knew I stopped talking and he just was ushering me to keep talking. And I had nothing else to talk about. So I. I just said, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. And I just went to commercial break. That's the, my instincts told me to go to break and to kind of regroup myself. So you had the, like, whatever, two minutes of a commercial break. <laughs> to right. Sort of figure out, oh, I burned 10 minutes. Now I've got another hour and 50 minutes to figure right. out. Right, 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 right. It was, it was, it was crazy because I could have just, you know, went to a commercial break, not panicked, and then came back and just – started over and this went back. It was a test show. I took it as like the world was listening to me at that moment. It was like my first show and I think my mom and like 20 other people was listening that first day. So <laughs> Now I know that Nate had has transitioned from a career as a stage actor, a theater actor to this uh, career behind a microphone interviewing people. So maybe it might be interesting for me to kind of um, ask him to compare those two facets of his life, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, So I might ask something like Talk to me about the feeling when you go on stage and the lights go up at the beginning of a, a play, a theater production, versus when the on-air light goes on in the studio. Talk about how those two moments compare. Which is scarier? Uh, definitely being on stage uh, because there's a captive audience right in front of you. That's why most people don't like doing theater. Um, 
But that is, to me, that's always been my life. So I understood. I could see the people who could see me. Radio, to me, is a little bit more scary because you don't know who's listening or watching. Um, now that we have, like, Facebook Live and YouTube Live, you can kind of see the bubbles of people who listen in, but you really can't see them standing in front of you. So it's a, uh, a little bit more intimidating to not know. So the unknown is more scary to me than the actual known. <laughs> I always am thinking also, you know, who my audience is, right? And in this situation, I do know it's not exactly like a radio show mm-hmm. in, the, in the sense that we're doing this for a purpose, right? Right. And because I have that in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, like, what a bonus that I'm, you know, you're, you know, I, I'm here ostensibly as the person kind of talking to you about, like, how to do an interview. But you know what? My guest is somebody who has spent the past four years of his life interviewing people. So I would be foolish, right, if I didn't ask Nate to talk a little bit about um, interviewing from his perspective, right? So why don't we do that? And I'll, and I'll say to you, uh, for the purposes of our audience, um, talk to me about what you've learned, mistakes you've made as an interviewer, uh, and what you've learned from those mistakes and sort of how you've grown behind the mic. Uh, the biggest lesson that I've, I've had is talking to the person before they get go live. Because you'll have a person who's so energetic and ready uh, and know what they're talking about. And the moment uh, we say live, we're on, they freeze up. They don't talk. Uh, So definitely talking to them, just getting them comfortable um, and talk to them between breaks. Uh, That goes along with the big lesson. But uh, just knowing who you're talking to. Don't ever blindly interview somebody unless you have no other choice to. Uh, Because you'll be just as stuck trying to usher and pull out any word at all from them. Because then they'll just close off if they feel like they're not comfortable. What I might do now, if I'm sort of following along this narrative arc, is to solicit a few examples from Nate um, of interviews he's done, maybe the highs and lows, right? So first, Mm -hmm. maybe I'll ask, like... um, What's your? Tell me your favorite uh, interview that you are most proud of that just went great and that um, you want people to remember you for. Uh, my favorite interview was had to be when Thelma from Good Times called in. A friend of mine was at an event with her and knew like that was my first crush and just got her to call in and just lined up that I was on my show at the same time. Uh, but we didn't know it was her on the phone. Um, so she gave her real name, um, and she said, hey, this is Bernadette Stannis. And I heard what she said, but I guess I was, like, kind of in disbelief. So we were all quiet and just at, like, did she just say what I thought she said? And then she just came out and said, this is Thelma uh, from Good Time. So that was my most memorable interview, um, and it was the most, my favorite interview because I had to, like, be on my toes and just keep it moving after being starstruck. Now, as an, as a producer, I'm thinking two things at this point. Number one, I'm thinking, I really hope that uh, there's like an archival recording of that show <laughs> when Nate got that phone call from Thelma, right? Because <laughs> what I can do, since I have the luxury of pre-recording these interviews and then slicing and dicing them, is I'll go and then maybe take that archival footage and I would sort of embroider that in, right? So now you go as a listener from like the Nate who's here telling you about that experience to hearing Nate like in the studio. And another thing I can do because this is pre-recorded is I can now, so I can, I, can, I don't have to play what he's saying uh, in the order that he's saying it. So now that I know this, I can, I can ask, I can actually have him set this up and I can, I can say to Nate like, uh, rewind to when you were a little kid, talk about um, like uh, what it was like to turn on the TV and watch Good Times and just like what a favorite sort of show that was for you <laughs> as a kid and why. Uh, for me, TV time was always, it wasn't as uh, fun because I didn't get to watch TV except for on a weekend. So a lot of things that I watched was like taped or recorded for me during the week and then I could watch them on a the weekend. So uh, that was kind of memorable because that was my time with my great grandmother I grew up with her so that was our time to watch shows together or my sick days we got to watch tv so good times was definitely one of the shows that we watched all the time and um tell me about who your favorite characters were on good times maybe specifically talk to me about the impact that Thelma had on you as a kid (laughs) uh 
mainly Thelma and Penny, the Janet Jackson character. Uh, those two were my kind of favorites. I love the show in general, but that was Thelma was kind of like I think most guys who saw that first crush. Um, she was pretty. She had a great smile, and she just had all this energy. So her and uh, Penny uh, were my favorites. Now, you see, what I've done there is I've collected that story from Nate, which I can now put in front of the conversation that we actually had before that, which was him sort of being surprised by the fact that Thelma called in the radio show. And so all of a sudden there's like a purpose to that reveal. Um, That's just an example of the way you can sort of order your reality and create a narrative arc in a in a conversation out of a conversation um because you know some of us are more geared toward coherent narrative arcs in the way we speak to the world than others um and you know it and so your job there's a there's a tendency i think perhaps for all of us when we're telling a story to to veer toward entropy right uh and so you have a chance to correct for that when you're doing a pre-recorded uh conversation like this um so I also uh, realize that, you know, people's attention spans, fascinating as this may be, uh, probably are getting to a point where they're like, OK, I get this. Um, so we'll get ready to wrap up in, in just a minute here. Um, but you see at this point, you know, we've only been talking maybe 10, 15 minutes and there's like a rich sort of foundation, many different directions we could go from here. I could ask mm-hmm. Nate to tell me. Tell me more about the time you spent with your grandma. I could ask Nate, tell me more about your theater career, some of the highlights of that. Uh, I could ask Nate, you know, um, what's coming up on your show? What's next? What's your next ambition? How do you want to grow from here? Um, one thing you definitely want to do um, when you once you've sort of collected that narrative arc is try to get some sort of moment of uh, general moment of reflection from the person that you're interviewing, like a zooming out, sort of a... Uh, like a uh, like a diary entry from the person at the end about what all of this means that you've been talking about, right? So, um, so like what I usually do near the end of a, a, a conversation, and since I know that this is mainly I, uh, what we've collected so far is going to be about this transition to uh, Nate's role as a radio host, I'll say, like, um, let me ask you to sort of wrap up by just talking about how you've grown as a person as a result of your time behind the microphone talking to other people? Uh, So I'll start with a question that I always ask people at the end. What advice would you give to your 17-year-old self? Um, And it kind of, that question to me was asked when I was was coming into radio, and it kind of depicts what would I do now versus... um, What would I have done then? And the advice that I always give to my 17-year-old self is just do it. Try different things. um, Explore the things that may make you scared or you're fearful of. And just don't be afraid to mess up. Um, So me just learning from past mistakes or hesitation or the lack of uh, go and get it that I had in my youth. Um, Just going forward, just being fearless and not afraid to just try things that aren't expected of me or my norm or the things that may scare me. That's a pretty good final thought. Um, But never hesitate to uh, basically ask the same question twice in maybe slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. It's almost like collecting multiple camera angles on a scene, right? So uh, I might ask a very similar question just to see if I uh, get any anything different. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But I'll say like maybe something like... um, like, if you think of your life so far as a story, mm-hmm. uh, what, what do you think the moral of your story is? Um, live on purpose. No fear, no doubt, no hesitation. Those sorts of um, encapsulating thoughts can go great at the, be- at the end of a conversation, right? Like at the end of a recording. They can also go great at the very beginning. But when you collect those things, it's almost like you think about what you're going to be making as a collage, a collage of the different things that Nate has had to say. Um, And so the more different sort of uh, hues you can collect on your palette, the more different anecdotes, the more different ways of him saying important moments from his life, the more options you're going to have when you make that final composition in your editing mode. Um, So... That's we could go on forever. Maybe there'll be a part two someday, <laughs> uh, but we'll we'll leave you with that. And uh, uh, thank you guys for uh, being interested and in, and in checking this out. And Nate, thank you. You've been a really good sport, and I'm I'm grateful to to know you better. Thanks. All right.